In this video, we'll talk about why we care about finding the area under curves and how we can approximate that using rectangles. So our discussion about derivatives originally started with talking about tangent lines to graphs and secant lines and how we can approximate these tangent lines. Now we're going to go into this next branch of calculus where I talk about areas under graphs of functions and we'll see how this all relates later on. So why do we care about the area under the graph of a function? Well, this area has sort of two main ways it can be applied physically. The first with this is travel and displacement. So the idea here is that if I drive at a constant speed, I can determine how fast I've traveled by just multiplying my speed by the amount of time I've been driving at that speed. In terms of a picture, if I were to draw out a graph, or I put velocity on this axis and time on this axis, if I go at a constant speed, then my distance traveled between these two points in time is just the area of this rectangle because it's time times speed. However, what happens if I'm driving at not a constant speed and my speed is changing as I travel? Well, in that case, I have a graph that looks something like that, but I can still find my distance traveled by finding the area inside the curve here. In the same way that the area on the left gave me distance traveled, the area on the right will also give me distance traveled even though the speed is not constant. This one's just multiplication, but this one on the right, we don't really have a technique for yet. There's no really nice way to find that area at this point. Another way we can think about this physically is that it's the work done by a force on an object. In the same way as the velocity time curve from before, the area under the force distance curve gives the work done on the object. The simple example here is just lifting an object under gravity. For this, your force is always just m times g, no matter what position it is, which gives me the work done or the energy as e is mgh, which is standard potential energy. I mean, think about more complicated ones, namely if you've got some sort of magnetic field going on or a spring, where the force you need is going to depend on location, depending on how far you've moved. So the graph of the first one will be a rectangle, like the constant velocity from before, but this one will have a non-constant force, meaning we'll have a more complicated area to find to find this worker energy. That's a couple reasons why you might care about finding areas under curves from a physical point of view. Or how can we find these areas? So we don't really have a way to find these areas yet, we can try to approximate them. In doing this, we kind of just do the best we can. So if I have a graph of a function over some interval, and I want to approximate the area, how can I do that? Well, what I can do is just chop this into a bunch of pieces, and then approximate each of these pieces by a rectangle based on where the graph is. So it's using this approximation, I would get that the area here was the total area under all of these green ones, which is not the same as the area in the blue curve, but it's close. And they take more and more rectangles, I'll get closer and closer to this actual area here. The goal is split this up into pieces, and then draw a rectangle over each piece, and then add up the areas of each rectangle to find an approximation of the area under the curve. And this gives us a way to at least approximate the area under this curve whenever we need to find it. So as an example, approximate the area under the graph of f of x, of x squared on 0 to 5 using 5 rectangles, taking left endpoints for the height. What I mean by that last part is we're going to use the function value at the left end of each subinterval to give me the height of the rectangle. We'll start by drawing a picture. There's our graph of x squared, at least the part we care about. And I want to find this on 0 to 5. So we'll put 5 here. And if I want 5 rectangles, that means I'm going to cut this up at 1, 2, 3, and 4. I, I take my interval length, 5 minus 0, and divide it by the number of rectangles 5, so that each rectangle has width 1, and I can draw on those rectangles. Now I'm told I want to take left endpoints as height. So for each little rectangle, I will draw a horizontal line across at where the left endpoint crosses this graph. So here I just get 0, then here I'll get it 1. Then here it'll come across where two hits, and where three hits, and where four hits. I want to find the total area of these rectangles. What's well, the first one? The first one is height zero, width one, so zero times one. The second is height one, width one, because it's one squared where it hits the graph. 
The third rectangle has height 4. It's the value of the function at 2. This here is at height 4. So 4 times 1, and then we keep going, plus 9 times 1 for the height at 3, and then plus 16 times 1 for the height at 4. This gives me a total area of 30. Let's see approximation I get to the area under the curve in this case. It's not correct, it's not exactly right to what the area actually is, but it's an approximation. If I were to take, say, 50 or 100 rectangles, I'd probably get a lot closer. But that's what you don't really want to do by hand. So let's say you can get an approximation with just 5 rectangles to what the area in this curve might be, and why you might care about using area in general to solve physical problems.